Good afternoon to you. Mark Suddeth, HurricaneTrack.com, here with your hurricane outlook and discussion. And yes, it's an actual hurricane outlook and discussion, not just an off-season version. Even though it is the off-season here on January the 14th, 2016, we are talking about a hurricane. Hurricane Alex in the Atlanta here. Show you what it looks like on a broader tracking map before we zoom in to the details. Top winds, 85 miles per hour. Way out in the eastern Atlantic, uh, this would be the Canary Islands. Here's the Azores, the Cape Verde Islands, and the west coast of Africa. And there is Alex, a 85-mile-per-hour hurricane. It got its start in this area as a frontal boundary laid across the region, and low pressure developed along that front. More extratropical or just kind of like a gale center uh, when it began, it moved up and around Bermuda, drifted to the south a little bit, and then now it's moving towards the Azores, where it'll pass through probably as a hurricane or certainly close to it. Hurricane warnings are in effect for that area. Luckily, this is not the same. That's the Azores right there, by the way, and you can see the track through there. This is not the same as a September hurricane with purely tropical characteristics with a very warm ocean underneath it. Now, it's still a hurricane, don't get me wrong, and I'm going to explain how you can have a hurricane over 70 degree water, uh, 68 to 70, when we know, right, that it's supposed to be 79, 80, 81 degrees to support hurricanes. Well, how can this be? I'll explain that in just a moment. This is a great satellite picture. There's Alex in the uh, northeast part of the Atlantic Basin here. You have Portugal and Spain the northwest coast of Africa. There's Cape Verde, Dakar. Uh, this is the Cape Verde Island region. And there is Alex. Now notice it's got a fairly small CDO, or what we call central dense overcast. And if we look at a zoomed in satellite shot here, what we call the floater infrared imagery, you notice a couple of things. First of all, clearly it has an eye, and a very clear eye at that. But it also has some fairly robust convection uh, around that eye. If we look at the visible satellite shot, even on here, uh, you can see that really nice raised area of thunderstorm activity right there around the eye. You can see the sun shining on the eastern side of the eye wall, some spiral banding going on with this. So it's a, you know, not your typical hurricane, but it is a hurricane. Well, how can this be since water temperatures in this region are not very warm. Alex located roughly in this vicinity and this water temperature profile uh, only about 68 to 70 degrees Fahrenheit. So how can this be? Well let's go read the discussion here from Dr. Richard Pash, forecaster Pash. He certainly knows his stuff and in the first paragraph of the discussion from earlier today uh, he says remarkably Alex has undergone the transformation into a hurricane. A distinct eye is present, I just showed you that on the satellite imagery, embedded within a fairly symmetric mass of deep convection. Water vapor imagery shows that the upper level trough is now west of the cyclone with divergent flow over the center, indicative of a tropical transition. So in other words, it's not getting its energy from the trough anymore, it's getting its energy from the difference, and this is the next part that he talks about, in the air temperature in the ocean to some degree, but the very cold atmosphere around Alex is what's really driving this, and this is where this gets mentioned. It is very unusual to have a hurricane over waters that are near 20 degrees Celsius, that's about 68 Fahrenheit, but the upper tropospheric temperatures are estimated to be around neg negative 60 degrees Celsius, which is significantly colder than the tropical mean. And so basically what this boils down to, this is what's allowing the instability and the convection to take place. You've got a very cold atmosphere around Alex and the ocean, which is almost 70 degrees. And so you have a very positive setup for convection or instability. Uh, if the atmosphere was warmer, it would take a lot more to push up that thunderstorm activity. And, you know, storm chasers on the plains know all about this. We call it a cap. You know, the atmosphere is capped. If it's, uh, if it's not cold enough for an air parcel to rise into and things are more uniform, uh, then you can't have convection. And so in this case, the warm ocean temperature 
isn't necessarily the prime ingredient here. It is that very, very cold, minus 60 degree uh, upper tropospheric atmosphere. And he mentions that that is the resulting instability likely coming from that main factor of a very cold atmosphere around Alex. And so we can see that uh, right here, this nice raised area of thunderstorm activity. All that cold air in the atmosphere around this is helping to support that with much colder sea surface temperatures below, but warm enough to draw out some moisture. I mean, think about it. We have cold air that comes over almost frozen lakes, and sometimes the lakes will freeze over, the Great Lakes of North America, and you get these lake effect snow bands that are not too convective in nature, but you still get these bands of precipitation because of the instability. The warm water of the lake, 34, 35 degrees, that's all you need sometimes. And then the air temperature of like 20 degrees or colder. And so that difference helps to create instability in the atmosphere. And over the ocean here, it's a much larger scale uh, situation going on. And therefore, you can have a hurricane over water temperatures that are way below 70 degrees. So there you have it. Uh, Alex will eventually move through the Azores here and then up into much colder water temperatures and there just won't be enough energy from the ocean to drive that convection underneath that very cold atmosphere and Alex will retransition back into an extra tropical ocean storm and more than likely just kind of meander around up here in the North Atlantic as all these big low pressure gyres spin around in the winter northern hemisphere pattern so there you go um, now looking ahead since probably a lot's going to be made oh hurricane in january we're probably going to have a really big season oh my goodness what do i do what do i do well not so fast this is an anomaly it's an outlier uh, we haven't seen anything like this since the 30s and the 50s um, you know it, it's rare okay and records are meant to be broken and so this is not necessarily indicative of anything that has to do with the upcoming hurricane season because we're still clearly in this El Nino state and Alex did not develop into a hurricane in the western Atlantic right off the Carolinas or Florida it had to get all the way over to the far eastern Atlantic for that transition to take place plus it's not down in the tropics it's in the subtropics. I explained how the difference in the atmosphere temperature and the ocean led to that instability. And bam, you have this unusual situation of Alex becoming a January hurricane. However, one thing to note that we do have to look at is the almost certain decay of the El Nino here. This is the very latest early January Climate Prediction Center International Research Institute um, well, consensus, probabilistic, and so forecast. All fancy for saying, here's what it looks like is going to happen to the current El Nino over the next several months. Now, this is the key area to watch right here, this block, to me, in my opinion. The August, September, October time frame. You see that the probability of El Nino is only about 13, 14% at best. So we think that the El Nino is going to fade away rather rapidly and then the probability of either neutral or La Nina conditions becomes more of a reality at this time frame. And you can see La Nina, the blue, increasing with time. It's actually a little bit lower on this early January update than it was in December, where it was just a little bit higher. But this is still far enough out into time that we don't need to worry about it. What is interesting, and this is another way to visualize this, Basically, the El Nino is just going to go right off a cliff. <laughs> I mean, that very warm pattern in the Pacific is going to die away pretty quickly as cold water comes underneath all that warm water in the subsurface, the cold water is. And then we're going to see this El Nino really plummet. Most of the modeling uh, in very good agreement about that. And then some of these models do take it into La Nina territory by the July, August, September, or August, September, October time frame which is the meat of the hurricane season, and that is more important to me than looking at Alex and saying, oh, wow, Alex is an indicator that this year is, is going to be very busy. I think the only way that that could possibly be true 
is maybe there's a little bit more moisture in the atmosphere because of this incredible El Nino putting a lot of moisture and energy in the atmosphere in the Pacific and that has maybe seeded the tropics around the globe. I'm, I'm reaching here, okay, trying to, you know, if there's any connection at all, it would be minuscule. Uh, really stuff that happens outside of the August, September, October time frame usually does not have a bearing on the August, September, October time frame. Even the early part of the season, you can have June and July be very busy, and that doesn't always mean you're going to have a busy August, September, October, the peak months. Um, so we'll see. You know, it's interesting, certainly, but don't look at Alex and think that that alone means we're going to have a very busy season ahead. We could still have that busy season, but I think it's going to be more because of the loss of the El Nino, the addition of the moisture in the atmosphere because of the El Nino in the Pacific, putting so much of that energy and moisture into the atmosphere globally, uh, that that would be the bigger contributor than saying, whatever in the world caused Alex means we're going to have a busy season. All right, so there you go. Anyway, that's it from me for today. If you're watching on YouTube, uh, press that old like button and subscribe for future video updates. I put these out on YouTube, and they also show up in our app called Hurricane Impact, available at the App Store and on Google Play. Uh, I am Mark Suttoth for HurricaneTrack.com with this unusual but needed Hurricane Outlook and discussion from mid-January. Probably won't be doing this again for a while, so figured I'd enjoy it while it lasted. Have a good rest of your Thursday. I'll be back on Monday with the regular off-season edition then.